first five verses this morning. Over the last few weeks, we've looked at some of the great stories of the Bible, in particular, great stories of the Old Testament. Uh, we might get back to some of those stories moving forward and kind of look at some great New Testament stories, uh, maybe in the next few weeks, Lord willing, we'll just kind of see what happens there. Uh, but for this morning, we are going to be in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. <coughs> We'll pray, and then we will jump in. Father God, we come to you this morning. I thank you for these good words. I pray that they would be a blessing to us, God. I pray that you would be glorified in everything that we read and every word that comes from my mouth today, God. I pray that you would open our ears and open our hearts to hear from you this morning. God, maybe there are things in our life you want to deal with us uh, in some certain way. I pray that we would be open to whatever way you might want to deal with us today, God. Maybe it's through encouragement. Maybe it's through correction. Whatever it may be, God. Let your Holy Spirit work in us today through your word. And I pray, God, that you just would hide me behind the cross. I pray that you would keep me humble. And I pray that you would just give me the words to speak to bring glory to you. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. But let's get a little bit of a background of what's going on leading up to these verses. Because the first word that we see here in Romans 5, 1 is therefore. And anytime we see the word therefore in Scripture, we need to ask ourselves, what is this word therefore? What, is, what was said before this that ties into what we are about to read? Now, leading up to this point in the few chapters before this, Paul had been talking to his audience about being justified by faith and not by works, not by anything that you can do, not by any actions you can do, not by any physical things that can be done to you, but we are justified, we are saved by faith. Now, the big problem when Jesus was on the scene and he was ministering and going around and preaching and teaching the Word and healing people is that there was a large group of people in Jesus' ministry who did not listen to what he said because they were more concerned about following the letter of the law. Now, when we read about the law in the Old Testament, we're talking about the law of Moses that God had given to Moses and the Israelites as they were on their way out of Egypt into the Promised Land. And there were lots of laws. We are probably familiar with the Ten Commandments, maybe more than some of the other laws, but there were hundreds of laws, over 600 laws. And so when we talk about the law, we are talking about what we see in Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. This is the law of Moses. This is the Old Covenant. Now, many of the people of Jesus' day, they were very concerned with following the letter of the law. But they missed the intent that God had when he gave the law. And so, boy, they would try their best to follow the letter of the law, but their hearts were never really on the Lord. They never really trusted the Lord. They never really had faith in the Lord. They were just kind of going through the motions. They thought, thought because of uh, what tribe of Israel they were born to, they thought because they were children of Abraham, that they were just automatically children of God and that they were good because they were listening to the law and they were going through physical things that God had called them to, in particular circumcision. Uh, Paul had talked about that in great detail in the verses leading up to this. And many of the people of Jesus' day... They thought that they were justified because they knew the law of Moses from the Old Testament well. And even followed it to some extent, but not with their heart. They thought because they were circumcised, we're, we're in. We are, we are God's children. We are God's people. God loves us because we fit the part. We look the part. But they weren't really children of God because they did not have faith in God. They didn't trust in God. They were very religious, but they weren't very righteous. Now, when Paul came onto the scene, these same people were giving him trouble. We see that throughout the New Testament. We see that addressed here in Romans. We see that addressed in the book of Galatians. We see that addressed in the book of Hebrews. There were still these people who thought that they were going to be justified and thought they had a good standing before God because they knew the letter of the law and they lived the letter of the law. And they did the physical things that required circumcision. They thought that they were in with God because they followed the law. But Paul had to address the same issue that Jesus had to address. And he said, nope, 
You're not justified because you follow the law. You're not, you're not justified because you're circumcised. You are justified through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. There is salvation that comes through none other than Jesus himself. Now, even though they knew the law, they didn't understand the purpose and the intent of the law. And leading up to this, Paul had been spelling it out to them. Look, you want to talk about Abraham? Let's talk about Abraham. In the Old Testament, it says that Abraham uh, had faith in God. He believed what God told him when God made the promise to him and said, Look, it's through you that I'm going to bless all nations. And it said Abraham believed God. He had faith in what God said. And the scripture says it was credited to him for righteousness. So Paul says, look, you want to talk about Abraham. You want to talk about justification. Well, how was Abraham justified? He was justified by his faith. Because when Abraham was justified and declared righteous before God, it was before the law was ever even onto the scene. It was before circumcision ever even came. And Paul said, look, Abraham was justified not because he was circumcised, not because he followed the law, but he was justified because he had faith in God. He was made righteous because he had faith in what God had told him. And Paul would say to his audience and to you and I today that we are made righteous too by our faith, by what God tells us, not by our works. Now what does God tell us? Tell us. God tells us to follow his son, to listen to his son. God said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. God tells us what to do. He says, in the Old Testament, I'm going to send one through the prophets. I'm sending Messiah. And then Jesus Christ came onto the scene. He was the Messiah. He was the one that God sent. And God's holy word says that we are to put our faith in Jesus Christ and that we will be made righteous through Jesus Christ. Not through the law. Not through our works. Not through anything physical that we do to ourselves. But only by putting faith in Jesus Christ. Paul told the people of his audience here, he said, look, Abraham was justified by faith, and so will you be justified by faith. Now, in light of all of this, that's kind of a big, big introduction to what we're talking about, but in light of all that Paul has said up to this point, he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we accept that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who gave His life for us, who was nailed to a cross, who willingly gave His life for us, whose blood was shed so that we could be forgiven, the one who was raised three days later, later and is not dead but is, is alive, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ as the one and only Savior, the only one who can forgive our sins, when we trust in His works, other than our own, we have put faith in Him. And Paul says, therefore, if you have done that, you have been declared righteous. Now, I don't know everybody's heart in here this morning, but I can tell you one thing for sure. If you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ this morning, you have not been declared righteous. Now, we may fall into the same trap sometimes as the audience that Jesus was preaching and teaching to and the audience that Paul was preaching and teaching to. And sometimes we may be tempted to think that it's because of our goodness and our works and our actions that we have earned favor with God, that God looks upon us and says, boy, he or she did such a good job. I love them more because of it. Now, God does love us when we do good and we're obedient to him. Don't get me wrong. He is pleased when we do good what he tells us to do when we're obedient to him. But we are not saved by our works. We do works because we are saved. We are saved by our faith in Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Therefore, if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, Paul says that we have been made righteous. We have been declared righteous. And not only that, he says, we have peace with God. It's through Jesus Christ that we have peace with God. Now later on in this chapter, in verse 10, Paul says that we were enemies of God. That apart from Jesus Christ, we are enemies of God. Now think about that for a second. We might not like to think about ourselves as being an enemy of God, 
We might like to think, well, I'm not that bad. Surely the really bad people are the enemies of God. But Paul says, look, while we were still enemies of God, Christ died for us. Why were we enemies with God? We were enemies with God because of our sin. And sin is against God. And when we choose sin over Jesus Christ, then we are enemies of God because sin is God's enemy. But through Jesus Christ, we can be delivered of our sins. Through Jesus Christ, we can be made righteous. Through Jesus Christ, we go from being enemies of God to being friends of God. In James chapter 2, verse 23, when he's talking about uh, Abraham in the Old Testament, it said Abraham believed with faith and it was credited to him for righteousness, and he became a friend of God. That's what a relationship with Jesus Christ does. Apart from Jesus Christ, if you haven't put your faith in him today, and you're living in your sin, and your sin looks better to you than God, then guess what? You're an enemy of God because you have chosen sin over Jesus Christ. You have chosen to sin other than receive the salvation and forgiveness that God wants to give you. And if you haven't put your faith in Jesus this morning, well, I've got news for you. You are an enemy of God. Now think about what it means to be an enemy of someone. Some of us may even have enemies. Think about in a war when there's a war being fought. The two sides that are going against each other are enemies. Well, what do you try to do to your enemies in those type of situations? Well, in a war type of situation, you want to destroy your enemy. Now, usually when we talk about war, there's a good side and a bad side. But regardless of which side is good and which side is bad, each side is enemies of the other. And when you're enemies with somebody, well, you want to destroy them. But what happens when you're at peace with somebody? Well, when you're at peace with somebody, you have no desire to destroy them. There's no awkwardness. There's no tension when you see them. Let's, let's put it on a, a, on, a, on a more simple level that maybe we can relate to a little more than war. People that we encounter in our daily life may be our enemies. They may be people that hate our guts. They may be people who wish to do us harm. And wish to destroy us in some way. Maybe our careers. Maybe our relationship with others. There may be people that we encounter that are our enemies. And what do our enemies want for us? Well, they don't want our good. Now, Jesus says in the New Testament that we are to love our enemies. And hopefully, this morning, if you are following Jesus Christ, you are loving your enemies. But even if we love our enemies... And our enemies still hate us. That does not mean that they're not uh, going to try to harm us just because we love them. And so it's not good to have enemies. We don't want to have enemies. Sometimes we can't help it. Sometimes we do everything we can to love people and they still hate us. And that's on them if we're following Jesus Christ and we're loving them to the best of our ability. But I would venture to say that probably none of us want enemies. We don't want to see those people that are our enemies, the ones that hate us. Boy, it's awkward even to walk by them in the grocery store. Because we know they hate us. We know they want to harm us. None of us want to be enemies of anybody. And when we talk about the war illustration, guess what? There's always going to be one side of a war that's going to win. And for those who are enemies of God, those who choose to live in sinfulness instead of put their faith in Jesus Christ, well, guess what? One day, God is going to deal with his enemies. Those who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ, one day are going to be dealt with by God. There is no escaping it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but being an enemy of God does not sound like a very good thing. The almighty creator of heaven and earth, the one who has made all things, the one who is in control of all things, that one day we will stand before him. I don't know about you, but I don't want to stand before him as an enemy of his. But praise the Lord, we can be delivered from our sinfulness. We don't have to choose the side of sin. We can choose Jesus Christ. And we can become a friend of God. And Paul says, since we have been declared righteous by faith through Jesus Christ, we are at peace with God. Praise the Lord for that. Isn't that good that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we can be called friends and not enemies? That when we follow Jesus Christ, we can be at peace with God? Now, peace is a good thing. We all like peace. It's good when, when, when you feel a peace come over you, when there's a stressful situation that's going on, and you feel at peace. 
To know that, that one day you're going to stand before God and in Jesus Christ you'll be at peace with God, not just while you're on this earth, but for all of eternity you'll be in the peace of God. There will be no tension. There will be no heartache, no sorrow, no pain. There will be nothing but just peace that comes only through God. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good thing to me, to be at peace with God. I hope that none of you here today are enemies with God. But if you are enemies with God, I want to tell you that you don't have to continue to be God's enemy, that you can put your faith in the one that he sent in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, and you can become his friend, and you can be at peace with God. And it is a peace that surpasses all understanding. It is a peace that is really indescribable. It is a peace that we see in Christians. In the deepest and darkest and most difficult situations, oftentimes you see Christians that are at peace. How can they be at such peace? It's hard for people to understand if they haven't put their faith in Jesus Christ. They can be at such peace because they are friends with God, because they have experienced the peace of God, and the peace of God it, it, it has, has, has come upon them, and it surpasses anything that we can even understand. Anything that we can really grab. And Paul says, look, when we are made righteous through Jesus Christ, we are at peace with God. Verse 2, he says, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, not only do we get to be in the, with, in the peace with God when we accept Jesus Christ, but we also, Paul says through our faith in Jesus Christ, receive God's grace. Now, I don't know about you, but just being in the very peace of God would be enough for me. Just knowing that I am loved by God, and that I love God, and that I'm not an enemy of God, that I'm just a friend of God, even if nothing else ever happened, just being in the peace of God would be a glorious thing. It would be a wonderful thing. But not only are we in the peace of of God when we follow Jesus Christ. But Paul says, look, we also receive grace when we follow Jesus Christ. Now, if we think of peace, uh, we make a think of peace similar to mercy. That is, uh, God is merciful to us. When we come to Jesus Christ, God doesn't give us what we deserve. Now, we deserve punishment for our sins. Uh, we, we, deserve, uh, we deserve horrible things for our sinfulness because our sinfulness is horrible. But all the things that we deserve, Jesus Christ took for us on our behalf and he gave us life on the cross. And so when we come to him, we don't get what we deserve. We get, we get mercy. We get peace. But not only do we get that peace and mercy, but we also, Paul says, get grace. That is, we get more than we deserve. We get blessings that we cannot even imagine, that we cannot even comprehend. That's what grace is. He gives us what we don't deserve. He lavishes blessings on us that are far more than we ever deserve. But he does it because we love him and we put our faith in Jesus Christ. So not only are we at peace with God, but we also receive the grace of God that comes through Jesus Christ. And Paul says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we have reason to rejoice, right? We have reason to rejoice if we've put our faith in Jesus Christ because we've experienced that peace of God. We've experienced that grace of God. And Paul says, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, what is the glory of God? Well, that's kind of a hard one maybe to explain. Maybe a hard one to kind of understand. What is the glory of God? We see the glory of God mentioned to us several times throughout Scripture. Well, perhaps... The glory of God may be best explained by thinking of the glory of God as beauty. Now, not just physical beauty, maybe intellectual beauty. Uh, yes, physical beauty, but, but maybe the best way for us to understand the glory of God is by thinking of the glory of God in beauty. Now, we see in some part the glory of God in this life. We receive a glimpse of the glory of God. Now, we don't experience God in all of His glory, but we do get a glimpse of the glory of God. In Psalm 19.1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Now, when we look up into the heavens, when we look into outer space and we see the stars, when we go to places on this planet and we see these beautiful places that we can go to, mountains that are beautiful, forests that are beautiful, oceans that are beautiful, 
we probably see those things, every one of us, and say, wow, this is amazing that God could create such a wonderful thing. And I believe that when we see those things, I believe that we are seeing a glimpse of the glory of God, a glimpse of just how great God is. Now, we see a lot of bad things in this world, of course, but we see a lot of beautiful things that God has created, that God has done. And in the beginning of, of the book of Romans in chapter 1, Paul even says, look, we are without excuse because we can all look around at nature and creation and see what God has done. And we are without excuse because we can see the greatness of God. Now, he doesn't use the word glory when he's talking in that passage, but I believe that maybe that's what he has in mind. What he's talking about, when we see these things all around us, we are seeing a glimpse, just a little glimpse of the glory of God and how magnificent he is. Now, not only do we see it uh, in, the, in the physical things that we see in this world, but I think we also see it in humanity. Uh, we see, uh, we see a, a love in humanity. Now, I know that you might be saying, well, you haven't watched the news lately. I know that we see a lot of bad stuff on the news. But listen, there are a lot of good people in this world. A lot of people who love and care for other people. A lot of people who have a desire to help those in need. And even people who are not Christians sometimes have those desires. Why? Because we are all made in the image of God. And the beauty that comes through people loving one another and helping one another, I believe that's just a little bit of a glimpse of God's glory. Just a little bit of a glimpse of, of this goodness, this desire that's in us, these wretched human beings that we are, that we still have the desire to do good for other people and to help other people and to be there for other people. I believe that that in and of itself is just a small glimpse of the glory of God. I see, uh, I, I said a while ago, intellectually I think we can see the glory of God. I look at people sometimes and they are so smart. I look at inventions that people make and it's unbelievable to me the things that people can do. That God has put a brain in our head that people can come up with the things that they can come up with. Wow, what, a, what an amazing thing. And I, I, and I see technology and I see these great achievements and buildings and things like that that people have made. And I think, boy, people have to be smart to come up with those things. What an amazing brain that God has put in our head that we can come up with such things. Now, all of these things, whether it be uh, creation around us, whether it be our own intellect that God has given us, whether it be a uh, love that we show for, uh, for other humanity, all of those things come from God. We don't have any of those things on our own. We're not responsible for any of those things. All of those things come from God. And they show us just a little bit of a glimpse, I believe, of the glory of God and how great He is. And one day we will see the glory of God in its fullest. And we hope, Paul says, he says, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Because we've seen a glimpse of it here. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we've seen just a glimpse of what the glory of God is. And so we rejoice in the hope for the day that we get to see the glory of God in its fullest. Now, I don't know about you guys. There are people in this world that I love, and there are things in this world that I like to do. But they are going to pale in comparison to what it's going to be like to be in the presence of God. We turn on the news and we see bad, horrible things that have happened in this world uh, as long as it's been here and will continue to happen until Jesus Christ returns. And we hope for a better day. We hope for a day when we won't just see a smidgen of the good of God, of the glory of God, but for a day that we will be with God and we will see God in all of His glory. And that's what we as Christians should hope for. That's the hope that we should be rejoicing in, the hope that we see the glory of God in its fullest. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, says, Paul says, look, uh, uh, now I see kind of dimly, but one day I'm going to see clearly. Right now we see just a little bit of what God's glory is, just a little bit of what God's goodness is, just a little bit of who God is, but one day we're going to see clearly God in all of His glory. In Exodus chapter 33, as Moses was leading the Israelites and, uh, out of Egypt and into the promised land, God was with them along the way and he was guiding them along the way and they had made some tents, they had made a camp there. And Moses went out from the camp and he had pitched up a little tent. He had called it the tent of meeting and God would descend on that tent and he would speak with Moses. And it says in that text that, that God would speak with Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. 
Now, we see these, these things in the Old Testament. We see times where God speaks to people. We see occasions where God is with people. Uh, for instance, where God uh, wrestles with Jacob. Uh, and Jacob is able to see God there. And we see other appearances in the Old Testament. Those are often referred to as theophanies, times that we see God take some human form. Uh, we see uh, Jesus Christ as God, and we are able to see scriptures where lots of people look upon God in that way. And so we see plenty of uh, instances, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, uh, where people are able to look at God and see God in some way. But there's uh, something else that happens in Exodus 33. Toward the end of Exodus 33, Moses says, God, let me see your glory. Let me see your glory, God. Now, a few verses later, he had been able to talk to God face to face, no problem. But when Moses says, God, let me see your glory... God says, look, you cannot see my glory and live. You can't do it. It's too great. My glory is too great for you. You can't see me. But God said, I'll tell you what I'll do. There's a rock here. I'll put you in the, in the crease of this rock, and I'll put my hand over you, and I'll walk by you. And as I walk by you, I'll let you look at my back. I'll let you see just a glimpse of my glory. Now, Moses had seen God face to face, but he didn't see God in all of his glory. He had only seen a glimpse of God. And when God passed by Moses, and as we read later on in Exodus, as God was with uh, Moses on the mountain, Moses' face began to glow. When he came down from the mountain, his face was glowing, and there was a veil that was placed over his face. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, Look, the veil was placed over the face of Moses so that the people could not see that his glory was fading away. Now Paul says, look, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, what we saw in the law, it was fading away. It was just a glimpse of God's glory. But there's a new covenant in Jesus Christ that is not fading away. That is not making God's glory fade away, but is making God's glory be ever more present to us. We see it more and more. And if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, the more you walk with Him, the more you seek God in His Word, the more you are obedient to Him, the more you look around, probably the more you begin to appreciate and you begin to recognize God in His glory. But even still, it's just a glimpse. But it's a glimpse for those of us who are in Jesus Christ. It's getting better and better and better. Because in Jesus Christ, it's not a glory that's fading away, but the glory that we see now is only going to continue to grow until the day that we are with God and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Because Moses couldn't see God in his fullest in that day. But there's coming a day when those of us who are in Jesus Christ will see God in all of his glory. And we cannot even begin to comprehend what that is going to look like. I can't describe it to you. I don't know what it's going to be like. It's going to be like anything better than we can ever describe. What is God's glory going to be like? I don't know. But I guarantee you one thing. It's going to be magnificent. It's going to be infinitely better than anything that you have ever experienced in this life. And we rejoice, Paul says. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I hope you're rejoicing in that hope today. I hope you have put your faith in Jesus Christ. I hope you see a glimpse of just how great God is through creation and then other people. But know that that's only a, a glimpse. That God is so much greater than anything that we've seen this far. When we see Him in all His glory, it's going to be the greatest thing we have ever seen. Verse 3. And not only that, but we also rejoice... In our afflictions. Now that's a little tougher there, right? Boy, we talk about the peace of God. We talk about the grace of God. We talk about the glory of God. The hope that we have to one day leave this sinful old planet and be in a place where we are in God's glory. Boy, we can rejoice in that. We can rejoice in that. That's great. But Paul says, don't only rejoice in that. Rejoice in the hard times, too. Rejoice in your affliction. Rejoice in your tribulation. Rejoice in your suffering. That's harder to do, right? We have hard times. Serious things that happen to us. There are serious things that we go through. There are hard times that we experience in this world. There are times of great loss and great sickness. There are times of great stress. There are hard times in this world that we experience. There are real afflictions. There are real sufferings. There are real tribulations that we go through. 
Paul says, look, rejoice in those things. Don't only rejoice in the hope that is to come, but even rejoice in your afflictions. As bad as they may be, as bad as the suffering may be, Paul says, also rejoice in that. He says a similar thing in Philippians chapter 4. He says, rejoice always, I say it again, rejoice. And in all things, through prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will be on you. Now, Paul knows what it's like to rejoice in good times and bad times. Read the New Testament. You'll see real quick that Paul had a lot of bad times. So when Paul is telling us to rejoice in hard times, this is someone who knows what he's talking about and someone who is doing what he is telling us to do. He says, look, rejoice in God and the peace you have in God and the grace you have from God and the glory of God that you will one day see in its fullest. Rejoice in that, but also rejoice in your affliction. Also rejoice in your suffering. Now, we've got to make sure that we know what suffering really is. Now, there are some times that we really do suffer. Don't get me wrong. I'm not belittling suffering. There are times that every one of you in here has probably suffered and will suffer. I'm talking about real serious suffering. But there are other times we say, oh, I'm going through trials and tribulations. Oh, this is so hard. Oh, I'm really suffering for the king. But there are a lot of times we're not really suffering, we're just complaining. There are a lot of things that we go through and we talk about and we complain about that are not really suffering at all. They're just us not being content with the Lord. We'll take these things and we complain about them, things that really don't amount to a hill of beans. And boy, we'll get mad about it. And boy, we'll complain about it. All the suffering that we experience. I remember years ago, I used to eat at uh, Taco Bell a lot, a lot more than I do now. And I would go there, and I'm pretty simple. And I would always get the same thing. I would always get a burrito with meat and cheese only. Now, that seems pretty simple. But I kid you not, eight out of ten times when I would go to Taco Bell, and I would order a burrito with meat and cheese only, and I would get to the window, and I would get it. Guess what I would get? A burrito with beans and cheese on it. I can't even know. And boy, I'd get so mad. Oh, I ordered this and they didn't give me the wrong thing. And sometimes there are little things like that that don't amount to a hill of beans. And boy, we get all worked out about it. We get all worked up. We get all excited. We get mad. We complain because we don't have this we want or we can't go to this place we want or we can't do this thing we want to do. And oh, we've got it so bad. Oh, we're suffering. No. A lot of things that we complain about and we pitch a fit about and act foolish about are not really suffering at all. Now there is real suffering that we experience, but we need to make sure we understand the distinction between the real suffering that we experience and just things that don't amount to anything. You know, sometimes we think we got it so bad. Oh, we got it so bad. Maybe we need to take a second and look around at others around us both here and other places of the world. There's real suffering that takes place. And maybe there's some real suffering that's taking place in your life. But there's definitely real suffering that's taking place all over the world. I was watching a show. It was a cooking show a few weeks back we were watching it. And one of the contestants on there, this was recent now, this is not this is this is new. This is happening right now today. One of the contestants on there was from Cuba. You know how much money that he made a month in Cuba? Now, now we might have a tendency to complain about, oh, I'm not making enough money. I need to make more. This ain't fair. I'm working myself to death, and I ain't making enough money. I'm not bringing enough in. Boy, we'll get mad. This ain't right. I do all this hard work, suffering every day. I ain't making hardly nothing. It ain't worth it. It ain't worth it. Well, we'll get to complain about those things that we suffer in. I was watching that show, and he said, you know, I worked hard. Trying to get my way in the United States. Talk about when he worked in Cuba. You know how much money this guy made a month in Cuba? Twelve dollars a month. He made twelve dollars a month. You know what the minimum wage in Cuba is right now today in 2020? Nine dollars a month. There's a lot of people in Cuba that are making nine dollars a month. I spend thirteen dollars and eighty-eight cents a month on fudge rounds. I went back and calculated it up. I spend more on little Debbie fudge rounds a month than some people are making in a month. Now, am I suffering? I don't think so. Boy, there are little things. And you, you guys may not do that. Y'all might not have little things you complain about. It might just be me. So let me just preach to me for a second. 
boy, little things like that will happen. I'll get mad and I'll think this ain't fair, this ain't right. Woe is me. Woe is me, all right. I better straighten up and realize, you know what? You got it pretty good. Now, a lot of things that we may call suffering are not really suffering. But there are times that we do really suffer. There are times that we do really experience loss. And we really experience pain. And we really experience sickness. And we really experience heartache. And we really experience stress. And these things are hard times when we experience those enemies that come against us. Those are tough times. Those really are times of suffering. And Paul says, look, and not only do we praise God, not only do we rejoice, we, do we rejoice uh, in the good times, but we also rejoice in our affliction. But why do we do that? Well, he tells us, we rejoice in our affliction because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. Even in our hard times, God is building our hope in Him. Even when things are difficult, even when we are suffering, even when it's hard, Paul says rejoice in that because even in that, God is building your hope in Him. Because when you suffer, it produces endurance. Because when we suffer, what do we do? Hopefully, we call out to God all the more. We pray to God. We seek His words. We trust Him. And what does He do? He strengthens us. We could probably, everybody in here, if you, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, everybody in here would probably say, yep, I remember a time. I remember two times. I remember a hundred times that I thought, how will I ever make it through this situation? I'll never make it through this. It's too much. And you call out to the Lord, and you cry out to the Lord, and you, and you shed tears before the Lord, and you seek God's Word, and you say, God, help me. And what does God do? He helps you through it. And what is he doing in those times, boy? He's building that endurance. He's building you up. Every single time you make it through a situation, you're trusting him that much more. And the next situation that comes, you're ready to go. Like a football player or a baseball player or a basketball player that trains and trains and trains and trains and trains and runs and lifts weights and does all of these things so that when game day comes, they can get on that field and they can give it 100% for three hours and not get tired because they've got the endurance because they put in the training. Boy, when we suffer affliction and tribulation and <coughs> suffering, we call out to the Lord, and He comes to us, and we experience His strength. And boy, He builds us, He builds us up. He gives us that endurance. He makes us to be men and women who are so proven in our character that we trust in Him, that we will not we will not turn from Him, that we will seek Him, that we will gain strength from Him. And all the while, He is using our suffering to build our hope in Him all the more because our affliction produces endurance, our endurance produces proven character, and our proven character produces hope. We already have hope. We saw that earlier. Through the peace and the grace of Jesus Christ and the glory of God, we hope in that. But even in our suffering, Paul says, God produces hope in us. He helps our hope to grow more and more. And he says in verse 5, this hope will not disappoint us. This hope will not disappoint us. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ to be our Savior, to deliver us one day from this world to a better place, to take us to a place where there will not be suffering, where there will not be heartache, where there will not be pain, where there will not be sin, to leave this whole sinful world and go to such a place through Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that He made on our behalf is a hope that will not disappoint. Now I can say this with the utmost confidence. I have never been to heaven, and I have never known anybody who's gone to heaven and has come back and told me about what heaven is like. But I can say with the utmost confidence, there is not a single man or woman from the Old Testament or the New Testament that put their faith in God, who is going to stand before God and are living in the glory of God right now, that are saying, boy, I'm disappointed in this. Boy, I have a hope in something. I'm disappointed in this. It does not happen. It has never happened, and it will never happen. The hope that we have in Jesus Christ, Paul says, is a hope that does not disappoint. It's a hope that does not disappoint. Let me tell you something. I don't know what you're hoping in today. I hope it's Jesus Christ. But you may be hoping in other things. You may be hoping in your wealth. You may be hoping in your health. You may be hoping in your friends. You may be hoping in your family. You may be hoping in your church. You may be hoping in your preacher. You may be hoping in countless things of this world. But let me tell you something. 
Every one of these things that I just mentioned and many more will let you down. Every single one of them will disappoint you. There is nothing in this world that will not disappoint you. But there is something better than this world has to offer. And that's Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ we receive a hope that Paul says will not disappoint. If you put your hope in things of this world, one day you're going to stand before God. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to be disappointed. But if you put your hope in Jesus Christ, on that day that you stand before the Lord, for all of eternity, you will never be disappointed in the hope that comes from Jesus Christ. This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now we've seen a glimpse of God's glory now. We see God in His Word. We probably, most of us, if not all of us, have seen God work in some way in our lives. And one day, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we will see God in all of His glory. But until that day comes, we're left here on this whole earth where there's suffering and there's heartache and there's pain and there's sickness and there's death. We're left here until that day comes that we get to see God in all of His glory. But Jesus told his apostles, he said, look, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. He said, I'm going to send one to you who's going to be a counselor to you, a comforter to you. And Paul says, look, right here, we have the Holy Spirit in our life. If we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit of God. God has not left us alone. He knows that we suffer. He knows that we struggle. He knows that we have hard times. He knows that we experience these afflictions. And so he has sent his Holy Spirit to us. So that through Him we can get the strength and the guidance that we need. So that through His Word we can see the truth of God. We can see the truth of Jesus Christ. And we can rejoice in that. Now I don't know what your hope is in today. But I hope it's in Jesus Christ. Because in Jesus Christ you will find peace with God. In Jesus Christ you will find the grace of God. And in Jesus Christ you will see the glory of God. Even if times are hard right now, rejoice in the Lord. Know that God is with you. Know that God has not abandoned you. Know that God has not left you. But God will strengthen you even in your most difficult times. Let your hope today be in Jesus Christ. Let your hope today be in the Lord. If your hope is not in Jesus Christ today, I hope you repent. I hope you acknowledge your sinfulness and you repent and say, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. Forgive me for putting my hope in my own abilities and my own wealth and my own help. But God, today I put my hope in your son, Jesus Christ, and his life that was given for me on the cross. If you've never repented, if you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I hope today you'll do so. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning. I thank you for these good words, and I pray that we would take up the heart. I pray that we would have our hope in you. God, I pray that we realize how great it is to be at peace with you, dear Lord. And we recognize the grace that you've given us and the blessings that you've given us, dear Lord. Help us not to be complainers. Yeah, God, there are things maybe that we want that we don't have. And things that we wish we could do and places we wish we could go. And dear Lord, we want those things, but help us not to be complainers when we don't get them. Help us to be content, dear Lord. Help us to praise you for the blessings you do give us, God. Maybe you give us the ability to help others. Help us to do that. God, maybe there are some here today who are really in a serious time of trouble, that are really in some affliction, God. Maybe they're, they're struggling. Maybe their stress is heavy upon them. God, maybe physically there are things going on that are, that are just that are causing them suffering and pain. God, maybe there's just some situation they're going through. God, there may be some real suffering in this room today, and I pray that you would help meet them in that suffering, God, that you would give them the strength to make it through it, that you would give them the endurance that comes through your word and through Jesus Christ, God, that they would seek you and that they would throw their hope in you all the Lord. God, I pray that there's one that has not followed Jesus Christ and this morning they do so, that they would repent of their sinfulness, that they would put their faith in you. And God, I pray that they would follow through in baptism just as your word commands. Dear Lord God, I pray that you just bless each one that's here. Let your word be a blessing to them, not just as we were here, but as we go into this world. Let us remember what your word says. I thank you that we can come here. I thank you for being good to us. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Thank you for joining us for today's service. To learn more about Jesus, call or text Pastor Shan at 601-657-0180 or email him at shanvn at me.com. You can also visit us at www.enterprisebaptist.church or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ebcliberty. We hope that you have been blessed by today's service.